Good morning, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. So praise the Lord, good to be gathered today. And you know, the Lord says in his word, he's magnified his word above all his name. So today, as we come to look into his word, may he write it upon our hearts and that may we order our lives according to his word so that he truly will be glorified through each life. Hallelujah. It's all about him receiving all the glory, all the praise, all the honor. And he's so deserving of it. And everyone said, Amen. Hallelujah. And so today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, Come to the Lord and Rest. Come to the Lord and Rest. You know, life's very busy, isn't it? But you know, God desires us to come to him. And we read, let's open our Bibles. I'm reading King James Bible to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And we read here just at the end of the chapter. What Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. And he says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Come to a rest and rest even for our souls. And before we came to the Lord, you know, we were spiritually lost, spiritually blind, spiritually naked. We lacked true peace and we were headed for an eternity in hell. That's what the word says. And however, it was the goodness of the Lord that he sought us out and that we can come to him and find rest. Let's turn to Psalm 40. Psalm 40, verses 1 and 2. And we can all relate to this as believers, I'm sure. And it says here, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Isn't that wonderful? God hears our cry. And when we turn to him, call out to him and go his way, he starts to, he puts our feet on a rock and establishes our goings. And the Amplified says, I waited patiently and expectantly for the Lord. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up out of the horrible pit, a pit of tumult and of destruction, out of the miry clay, froth and slime and he set my feet upon a rock steadying my steps and establishing my goings amen you know our lives need to be built on the rock and who's the rock Jesus and who is Jesus he's the word of God amen and also let's turn over to Romans chapter 2 just to confirm all this Romans chapter 2 how good the Lord is Romans chapter 2 Verse 4, and we read here, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Hallelujah. And repentance, you know, we know it means a, a remorse of sin. You know, we're, we're absolutely convicted of sin and we're sorry about it. And it also means not just being sorry, but we change our mind. We have a change of mind. And it means we stop deliberately doing sin. We, we stop it, you know, with God's help. And we choose God's way. And that includes holiness. And because of God's goodness, coming to him and getting saved, it was his idea. It's his goodness that he drew us to himself. Amen. And God is love and love is patient. And we just read in the Amplified Bible, it says, Or are you so blind as to trifle with and presume upon and despise and underestimate the wealth of his kindness and forbearance and long-suffering patience? Are you unmindful or actually ignorant of the fact 
that God's kindness intend, is intended to lead you to repent, to change your mind and inner man to accept God's will. Makes it clear, isn't it? We have a change of mind and have a decision to, dis, to accept God's will for our lives. Amen. And even so, being saved and coming to God, you know, it brings about changes in our lives. But these changes are for the better. Hallelujah. And also these changes, they're not just a one-time event, but they're an ongoing occurrence as our walk deepens with the Lord. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. Don't you just love God's word? It's just so encouraging, so strengthening, and it, it leads and guides. Hallelujah. Psalm 73 and verse 22 to 28, it says, So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. It's encouraging, isn't it? Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. In verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Amen. We put our trust in the Lord and he has drawn us to himself. And when we draw near to God, he ministers to us. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Verses 28 to 31. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And I'll just read it from the Amplified. It does open it further. And I'll just read it from verse 31. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. And they shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles, mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint or become tired. Hallelujah. What's the key? Waiting on the Lord. Amen. And, you know, we're told to study God's word in 2 Timothy 2.15. And we're to rightly divide the word. It says, study to show yourself approved of God. Rightly, as a workman, it needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of God. So God wants to study us to study his word. So we get understanding of his word and his ways. And for this studying to be profitable to us, we read in 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that it must be done from all scripture because it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So this topic, it's called come to the Lord and rest. And when we study rest, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it basically means to repose. 
Now that's a word we're not really familiar with, but when you looked up the meaning of that word, it means to rest by putting one's head down on a pillow. It means to lie down, to cease from activity and exertion, to be still. Respite from toil, like we take a break from toiling and to refresh, re, to refresh from rest, right? So when we rest, there's a refreshing in the Lord. Hallelujah. And the word rest also means freedom from worry. And it means to settle, to dwell and to abide. So that's what the Lord wants to do in our lives in this rest, that we don't have worries that we can uh, be refreshed in his presence, that we can be in him and let him have his way. Hallelujah. And let's turn to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> and it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Hallelujah. And that word lie down, it means to crouch on all fours, but it also means to recline, to repose, which is what we read before, and to rest. So to lie down is to rest. And that word still, it leads me beside still waters. That actually means to repose as well. And it means to be peaceful. So still waters are peaceful. And it's an abode. It's a place of rest. And it means to be comfortable, at, to be at ease and quiet, rest and resting place. So still waters is where there's rest and a resting places. You know, and still waters are deep waters. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so this is what the Lord desires to do for us. And then we read in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that word dwell comes from the same Hebrew word and it means to sit, to make and to abide. So when we're still and when we dwell, it's to be in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. And we read here, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute just judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judas shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Israel will dwell safely. It's in that day. And let's turn over to Hosea chapter 2, verse 18. Hosea chapter 2, verse 18. Hosea, it's just before Joel, Hosea chapter 2, after Daniel, chapter 2, verse 18. And it reads, talks about in that day, 2 verse 18, and it says, And in that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. There's that lying down, coming to rest again. And in that day, that definitely refers to the day we now live. And what else occurs in that day? Let's read on. Verse 19. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, in judgment and in loving kindness, and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, says the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn, 
which is the word of God, and the wine, the life of God, and the oil, the anointing, and they shall hear Jezreel, which speaks of Israel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that has not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. Hallelujah, what the Lord's going to do in the earth. We were far off and yet he's drawn us to himself. He's called us to himself and he's and betrothed us to be married to him in that day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So what an exciting time to be living in. Amen. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, I'll read it. It says, now all these things happened unto them speaking of natural Israel, for examples, and they are written for our admonition, which is warning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. All right, so things happen to natural Israel as an example to us and a warning to us. So let's, um, let's turn to something that happened to natural Israel, Leviticus 26. And we know there's a principle in the word of God of first the natural, then the spiritual. So Natural Israel is first and then follows spiritual Israel. So Exodus, sorry, Leviticus 26. Verses one to three. And it says here, you shall make you no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land, to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. Hallelujah. 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 Sabbath, it means rest. And there is a rest in God. He said, keep my Sabbaths. And we know from natural, from reading the scriptures, that natural Israel, they had a weekly Sabbath. However, this scripture says they were to keep the Sabbaths, keep my Sabbaths, plural. And to help us understand this, natural Israel, they had an agricultural year when they harvested their crops. And scripture reveals there were seven extra Sabbaths. And they were called holy convocations, which is quite a mouthful, isn't it? But I'll just call them special Sabbaths, like extra Sabbaths, all right? And they occurred during these three feasts, during these three harvests. And again, Sabbath means rest. So throughout their agricultural year, natural Israel celebrated these three harvests with three feasts. And there were seven extra Sabbaths, special Sabbaths, called holy convocations, or as I say, special Sabbaths. All right. Again, natural Israel are an example to spiritual Israel, God's church. And so the three harvests were barley harvest, which occurred in the first month. And it was the feast of, called the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover. And it had two special Sabbaths in it. And that feast speaks of salvation. The second feast, the second harvest was a wheat harvest. And it was called the Feast of Weeks. And we know it as Pentecost. And that happened in the third month. So it was 50 days after the first month. And it had one special Sabbath. And it speaks of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the third feast or the third harvest was a fruit harvest. And it was called the Feast of Tabernacles or ingathering. And we know it as Tabernacles. And it had four special Sabbaths in it. And it speaks of full spiritual maturity. That's the fruit. And God desires us as believers to experience all three feasts in our lives and if you'll just uh, listen carefully to this 
the purpose of participating in all three feasts is to bring us to the 10th day of the third feast. And it was called the Day of Atonement. It was in the middle of the feast. And it, atonement means one with God. Full atonement. It means full salvation. And for us, that means when the marriage of the Lamb takes place to his fully atoned, perfected bride. That's when it will occur on the Day of Atonement. But it's in the third feast. Hallelujah. Meanwhile, if Israel obeyed God's word, then God would do what he promised in the next verse. So let's read on verses four to six. Then I will give you rain in due season and the land shall yield her increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. We're likened to trees, believers are trees, are bringing forth fruit. And your threshing shall reach unto the vintage and the vintage shall reach unto the sowing time. There is going to be an abundance and you shall eat your bread. Bread's the word. Eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. And I will give peace in the land. And you shall lie down. Sounds like Psalm 23, doesn't it? Peace in the land and lie down and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land. Neither shall the sword go through your land. Hallelujah. So he'll give us rain. And rain in scripture, it actually speaks of the word of God. And so it's the rain, the word of God, as it comes on our life, like rain falls, as it comes on our life, it's going to cause that fruit where the trees to bring forth fruit. Hallelujah. And that's going to be great, a great harvest of fruit. Amen. And in the Lord, so in the Lord, we are to be at rest every day, every day, and not just on particular days like the children of Israel were. All right. Every day in the Lord, it's a rest. Hallelujah. Meanwhile, that word dwell it actually means to sit down, you know, to dwell in him, to settle, to be still. So let's turn over to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Verses four and five. And this is what David wrote down on behalf of the Lord. It says here, tw Psalm 27 verses four and five. One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Hallelujah. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. Uh, we are the dwelling place individually and collectively with the Lord, but we want to remain in him, in his house. It's a spiritual house made up of people throughout the world. And, you know, that's my desire. I know that's your desire that we might remain in him all the way to the end. Hallelujah. And that word dwelling, he said that I might dwell in the house of the Lord. It's associated with being planted. And so let's turn back to Exodus 15. Exodus 15, verse 17. Exodus 15, verse 17. And it says, and this is what the Lord says, And thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in and in the sanctuary of the Lord, which thy hands have established. Wow, just listen to this. So they, we're going to dwell in him and his hands have established. Who are his hands in our time? What are they symbolizing? The fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. His hands have established it. This is what God's going to do in the earth. Hallelujah. That may, we may dwell. And let's turn back to Psalm, back into Psalm, Psalm 1. And we read here, Psalm 1. Verses 1 to 3, 
Blessed is the man. Doesn't that sound good for a start? Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, which is the word of God. And in his law, in his word, does he meditate day and night. And listen to it. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and shall bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Hallelujah. 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 We need to be planted by the rivers, planted by the water. Water comes from rain. Hallelujah. Planted by the water. The word of God is the water. I'll say it. The word of God is the water. We're to be planted in God's word. Hallelujah. 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 And then let's turn over to Psalm 92. And we read here in verses 12 to 15. And it says here, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. So they're both upright trees, aren't they? They're strong. Verse 13, Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age and they shall be fat and flourishing. To show that the Lord is upright, he is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him, in him, planted. You know, we need to be planted in the Lord. You know, in the natural, if you've got a garden and you um, have plants there and you pick this plant up and you move it there and you pick it up and you move it there and you pick it up and you move it there, it won't get established. Its roots won't get established. It won't get down and founded correctly. And so as some um, living trees in the Lord, we need to be planted where God would have us to be planted and get fixed and get our roots down and be planted beside the word of God. The word of God is what's going to bring about the fruitfulness in our lives, in our, on our tree, the fruit, the full character of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes through the word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And also we read that, you know, natural Israel is a warning to us, not only an example, they're a warning to us. So let's turn over to Isaiah 29, verse 13. You know, there's no secrets with the Lord. <laughs> Isaiah 29, verse 13. And we read here, Wherefore the Lord says, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth, and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their heart from me, and their fear toward me is taught by precept by the precept of men. And I'll read it from the Amplified. And the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth, and honour me with their lips, but remove their hearts and minds far from me, and their fear and reverence for me are a con are a commandment of men that is learned by repetition without any thought as to the meaning. All right. God doesn't want just our lip service. He's never wanted lip service or repetition or religion. He's always been after our heart. It's our heart he's interested in and that things come towards that we press towards God from our heart. Yes, we make a good decision to serve and follow the ways of God. But our heart needs to be in all of that. God looks on the heart. Hallelujah. And that's where faith resides. That's where decisions come from. And so what happens in our heart is really important. And as I said, you know, there's no secrets from God. So, you, you know, we could be in church and lifting our hands, praising God and so forth. But if our heart's not in it, God's not going to receive it. He wants it to come from our heart because we, we lift our hands because we love him. We serve him because we love him. We, we praise him. We worship him because we love him. It's got to come from our heart. Hallelujah. But that wasn't natural Israel's ex ex uh, experience. Let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3.
Verse 10. We'll just read through here a bit. Verse 10. And the Lord says, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation. So this is the children of Israel. They And said, They do always err in their heart and have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath that they shall not enter into my wrath. Into my rest, sorry. Into, I, I'll say that again. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. Sin thinks Oh, it'll be all right. Nobody knows. Nobody sees. I can do what I want. It's deceitful because you can't hide anything from God. And it says we're the ones that get deceived if we're going down those and making those choices in that pathway. Verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Right? It's not just how we start the race or, you know, serve God for a, a time. But we need to continue to serve God unto the end. Remain steadfast, steady, strong, focused in the Lord to the end. Verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. That's in the testings and trials. 16. For some, when they had heard, did, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They didn't enter in. They didn't keep their trust and confidence in God. They didn't remain steadfast. So unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't, enter into all that God had for them. And what happened to them in the wilderness? They hardened their heart. And everything that happened to natural Israel is an example and a warning to us. And so we always need to have soft, pliable hearts, hearts that can be easily adjusted and instructed and corrected by the word of God. The word of God is what brings correction to our life. It's the word of God that brings instruction to our life. It's the word of God that brings adjustment to our lives. Hallelujah. Amen. And then in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1, it says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, and any of you should seem to come short of it. Again, this word rest, it means to repose. It means to put one's head on a pillow like we said before to lie down God wants us to come to a complete rest in him it means to cease from activity you know there's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 and 2 I think this it says repent from dead works you know dead works are anything that God doesn't inspire so you could be doing things or we could be doing things but is it God initiating is it God leading and directing us and so we just need to be aware that um, the rest he's after it's the rest that he brings about it's both he's to will and to do and so he's working in our hearts in our lives to bring about his will hallelujah and this rest that he's talking about it's not a natural rest of inactivity but it's a rest from the works of the flesh or our dead works as I said before but the works of the flesh and the works of the flesh is our soul realm. That's what he wants us to rest from, the works of the flesh. And the works we do for the Lord are to be done in faith. Hallelujah. And it's as the Lord leads. So let's turn back to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. And we read here, Thus says the Lord, Stand you in the ways and see, and ask for the old path, where is the good way, and walk therein, 
and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. All right. So here they have asking for the old pass. It's a good way. And the Lord's saying, you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in there. Right. They refused to walk in God's good ways. And so they had no rest in their soul. And the soul realm, it's our mind, it's our will, and it's our emotions. And if we're not resting in God, walking God's way, doing it in God, we won't be in a place of rest. And let's turn back to Matthew 11, where we started at the beginning of this. Matthew 11, and see what Jesus said. Matthew 11. Verse 28, and we read here what Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There's a rest in God. Resting in God is not toiling. There's a rest in God. And that talks about a yoke there. You know, in the natural, a yoke, it was a piece of timber, cross piece, piece of timber that was put across the necks of the two oxen. And so they were joined together. They were joined together. And, you know, we are to be joined to Jesus Christ. And to be one with him. Amen. And it says here that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So when we're yoked with him, what a, it's a place of a rest. We might still be working, but there's a rest in the working. Heck, if I can say it that way. There's a rest while we're working with him. Hallelujah. Because we are fellow laborers in the field. And so we're with him, resting with him. Hallelujah. Let me just read it from the Amplified. It says, Come to me, all you who, are, are lab who labor and are heavy laden and overburdened. And I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Most people think about rest is, oh, you just go lie down in bed. But, God's talking about a rest that's going to impact our soul. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle. That means I'm meek and humble, lowly in heart. And you will find rest, relief and ease and refreshment and recreation and blessed quiet for your souls. There it is again. For my yoke is wholesome, useful, good, not harsh, but not harsh or hard or sharp or pressing or comfortable, gracious, but rather gracious and pleasant. And my burden is light and easy to be borne. So if we're going through something and it's um, hard and sharp and pressing and harsh. That's not God. That's not coming from God. It might be coming from the enemy or it might be coming from our flesh wanting to have our own way. Because God's ways are easy, pleasant, and easy to be born. Hallelujah. You know, God's word's trying to help us here. So hallelujah. And so God desires there to be a rest in our souls. And again, the soul realm is our mind, will, and our emotions. In other words, our flesh. And we read what the works of the flesh are. In Galatians, let's look at it. So we've got it on record here. Galatians chapter 5. Verses 16 to 21. So these are the works of the flesh. And it says here, Galatians 5, starting in 16. This I say, then walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. And so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, 
you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I have told, have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's really clear, isn't it? All those activities, are, God calls them works of the flesh. But where do the works of the flesh come from? The works of the flesh actually are in our heart. Jesus said, let's turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, and uh, we'll start from verse 17. Do you not yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man or the person. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. All right, so there we are, back to the heart again. It's what's going on in our heart, in every person's heart, that God's trying to bring adjustment to amen so how is our heart really going to be dealt with again natural israel are our example natural israel when god brought them out of egypt and it, by the hand of moses and he said to moses i want you to build me a tabernacle which was a a big structure out in the desert and it had a tent inside and they called it the tabernacle of moses and it had three sections. It had an outer court, a holy place, and a most holy place. All right. And the holy place measured 2,000 cubical cubits and speaks of the church age. All right. And in that holy place, so the outer court just had a curtain around it. But in the holy place, in the most holy place, it was covered around the sides as well as on the top. So there was no natural light there. And in the holy place, there were three pieces of furniture, the table of showbread, the candlestick, and the altar of incense. And the candlestick, it carried lamps to give light. Let's turn to Exodus 25. In verse 31, and this, this is what the Lord instructed Moses, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls and his knops and his flowers shall be of the same. All right, that's the same measurements. And verse 32, And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out on one side, and three branches of the candlestick out on the other side. So there's a candlestick. It's got three coming out this side and three coming out this side and the middle shaft. So that makes seven branches. Seven branches in all. And the purpose of the candlestick was to carry the seven lamps. So on the end of the branches, there were these little lamps, right? And it was the lamps that gave the light. And the seven lamps were filled with oil so the lamps would burn brightly. And verse 37, it says, And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give 
light over against it. So the candlestick's giving light. If the, can if the lamps are lit, they're giving light. Hallelujah. And so the only way the candles, the seven lamps could give light was if they were filled with oil. Exodus 26 verse 35 and it says here and thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle towards the south and thou shalt put the table on the north so <laughs> there's a veil or well, sorry going this way there's a veil before the most holy place and the table was on the north side and the candlestick was on the south side all right and it says here that verse, I was just going to say that that light emanating from the candlestick that actually revealed or showed the table of showbread, all right, because they're both in the same section, but only the candles got the light. And on that table of showbread, showbread were 12 loaves and they speak of the word of God and being 12, the apostles doctrine, okay, 12 loaves. And, you know, only the priests were allowed to eat the bread that was on that table. They called it the showbread. Only the priests. And Exodus 30, verse 7. And this is really important. And Aaron shall burn there on sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamps. He shall burn incense on it. And the Amplified, verse 7 says, And Aaron shall burn on it incense and sweet spices every morning. When he trims and fills the lamps, he shall burn it. Hallelujah. Every day the high priest, Aaron, he trimmed the wicks on the lamps and filled them. And the, the high priest, he cut off the dead wicks. So the lamps would shine brightly and burn brightly. Okay. And he also filled the lamps with fresh oil. Jesus, he's our high priest. And he trims and cuts away from our heart what is not required, the dead bits. And how does he do that? He uses his sword, his word, which is the word of God. Hallelujah. Let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Verse 23. And it says here, For the commandment of the Lord, the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. And Psalm 119. And verse 105. Says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And we just read that the candlestick had seven lamps. And seven is the number for complete perfection and completed work. Therefore, the church, because the candlestick, because remember in Revelation chapter two and three, there's Jesus in the midst of the candlestick. The church is to carry the complete full word of God as revealed by the Holy Spirit. All right, the candlestick, the church. Hallelujah. And in contrast, if there's no word being given, then there'll be no light. And that will lead to a stumbling and a falling away. You know what it's like in the dark. If you're in the dark, you can't see where you're going. You bump into things, you trip over things. But if you put the light on, the pathway is really clear. And so God's church is to buy, shine brightly. Hallelujah. And she shines with the word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, gee, I just thought then, then you know, you've seen uh, on, the, on the seas when there's ships out there 
and there's the um, the lighthouse and when it's dark out there the lighthouse got the light shining and that's so the ships can find and navigate their way through the dark hallelujah and we're in a dark world spiritually and yet the word of God is a lamp for our feet and a light to our pathway so that we can navigate through this world and grow up and be all that God would have us to be. Hallelujah. And in verse 130, this is Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, Thy entrance of thy words gives light. It gives understanding unto the simple. The word of God, it needs to enter into our heart. That's where he wants to put his word on the fleshy tables of our heart. It needs to enter in. And if it's entering in, it will push the other things out. Hallelujah. It'll deal with the other things. And the word of God, you know, shows us how we are to walk the walk. And we are to order our lives according to God's word. Hallelujah. And regarding the trimming of the wicks, you know, the high priest, our high priest, Jesus Christ, he uses the word to deal with what's in our heart. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And we read here, the, for the word of God is quick. That means it's alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows and as a discern of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That's how powerful God's word is. The Amplified opens it up. For the word that God speaks is, is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating to the dividing line of breath, of life, which is soul and the immortal spirit and of the joints and the marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting, analyzing and judging, the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. <laughs> doesn't matter what's happening. It, well, it does matter what's happening on the outside, but God knows how to get right to the root of the matter. All roads lead to the heart and the purposes and why we do and what we do all come from our heart. And so as we gather the manna, like the children of Israel were commanded to do, which is the word of God daily, our high priest, Jesus Christ, using the word of God, will cut off from our hearts the works of our flesh. We can't actually do it. We can make good choices, yes, and <laughs> we can make good choices, but if we go, well, I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do this, and I'm not going to do this, that actually puts us back under the law, and no one could keep the law. But if God can by his word, take those desires out of our heart, then we'll be able to walk that walk. Those works of the flesh will be cut off. Hallelujah. 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 Do we read the trimming of the lamps anywhere else in the Bible? Yes. Regarding the virgins in Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and we read here in verses 1 to 2. And it says, Then shall, round 1 to 4, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil in them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So Jesus gives us a warning of what happens when lamps are not trimmed. Let's read on. And those virgins, they speak of those that are born again. Verses 5 and 6. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. And we are in the midnight hour. 
And so we must stay spiritually awake. Verses, verse 7. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the Amplified says, Then all those virgins got up and put their own lamps in order. Amen. And let's read on. Verse 8. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, Say not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. The other virgins being the foolish virgins. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. So we don't want to be like the foolish virgins who were asleep at the time of the wedding and they were not ready and consequently they had the door shut on them. So now's the time and we were able to and, and the Holy Spirit prompts us, you know, leads and guides us that we can actually trim off some things that we know, we know we can just make good choices, can't we? We know that's not going to be good. And with God's help, you know, we can trim off some things that we know that are not pleasing to the Lord and order our lives according to God's word. And then we'll be able to shine brightly. But as I said, we can't get back under a law thing. It's Lord, change me by your word. Change me by your Holy Spirit. That I'll have a desire to do what you'd have me to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And let's turn over to Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, what Jesus says. He wants us to shine brightly. And Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, let me read from, from verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Hallelujah. And verse 16 in the Amplified says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble and good deeds and recognize it, honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Hallelujah. That's letting our light shine. And Matthew chapter 13, that's in verse 43, that says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, who had ears to hear, let him hear. Hallelujah. That's right down the end. And we are coming into that time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Righteous shall shine. And we read that in the Amplified. It says, then will the righteous, those who are upright and in right standing with God, shine forth like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let him who has ears to hear be listening and let him consider and perceive and understand by hearing. Those ears to hear are our spiritual ears. We can hear with natural ears, but it's when we hear with our spiritual ears in our heart, that's when we really hear and that's when the adjustment's taking place in our heart hallelujah hallelujah so let's just return just a little bit further to the candlestick back to exodus 30 verse 7 exodus 30 verse 7 and we read this before and aaron shall burn there on sweet incense every morning when he dresses the lamp he shall burn incense on it Hallelujah. And I'll read it from the Amplified. It says, And Aaron shall burn on it incense of sweet spices every morning when he trims and fills the lamps. Hallelujah. The only way the lamps could give light was if they were filled with oil. And the high priest fills the lamps with oil. And Exodus 35, let's turn over the page here. Exodus 35, 14 and 15. It says, 
the candlestick also for light and his furniture and his lamps with the oil for the light and the incense altar and his stage and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering of the tabernacle. All right. So the oil for the light speaks of the Holy Spirit and the burning of the incense speaks of our prayer life. So as we pray in the Holy Spirit, so too our oil is topped up. So we continue to burn brightly. That's how important it is to be praying in the Holy Spirit. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And we read here, it says, And be not drunk with wine, where is, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And the Amplified says, And do not get drunk with wine. That's quite clear, isn't it? For that is debauchery. But ever be filled and stimulated with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And so another way of saying that is be being filled with the Holy Spirit or continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And how do we continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Jude, the book just before Revelation. Jude, there's only one chapter in Jude. And it's verse 20. And it says, Be ye beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, Praying in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praying in the Holy Ghost. So we need to keep praying in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. It builds us up, keeps our lamps glowing. Hallelujah. Keeps the life of God flowing. Hallelujah. And meanwhile, praying in the Holy Spirit, just like it did in the tabernacle, that light, it brings illumination to the word of God. Just like the candlestick did in the in the holy place, it illuminated the table of showbread. When we're praying in the Holy Spirit, it will give us understanding of God's word. He will give us understanding of God's word. Because the Holy Spirit was sent to lead and guide us into all truth. Let's turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 17. And we read here, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is a, a real experience. And the evidence of that is speaking in other tongues. Hallelujah. And chapter 16, verse 13, it says, Howbeit when he, he's the third person of the Godhead, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So going forward for us, we'll never be able to repay what God or what Jesus did when he died on the cross for us. However, we can come to the Lord and offer him our lives. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Hebrews 10, 22. It says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The Amplified says, let us come forward and draw near with true, honest and sincere hearts in unqualified assurance and absolute conviction engendered by faith, by that leaning of the entire human personality on God, in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom and goodness, having our hearts sprinkled and purified from a guilty, even, evil conscience and our bodies cleansed 
with pure water. What's the pure water? It's the word of God. All roads lead to the heart and all roads lead to the word of God, bringing adjustment to our hearts. And then Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Hallelujah. Holiness. God's doing it in us. James 4. If we turn to James 4 and verse 8. And it says here, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And the Amplified says, Come close to God and he will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. Get your soiled hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal. Wavering individuals with divided interests and purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. You know, there are many distractions in this life trying to get our attention, aren't there? We know that. We live, our feet are on the ground. We're seated in heavenly places, but our feet are on the ground. And so things try to get our attention away from God and onto other things. Therefore, we need to make, you know, with God's help, make good choices and just keep coming to the Lord. Just keep coming to the Lord. Amen. However, there's a cost in coming to the Lord. So what is the cost of coming to the Lord? The cost is our self-life. It's our ways, our thoughts, our plans. There's a cost, but it's worth paying. Hallelujah. It's out. The, um, and so what's the best offering we can do with the Lord is to just give him ourself. Hallelujah. Just say, Lord, here I am, you know, just as I am. I just give you my life. I just give you all of it. But not only do we give it to him initially when we get saved, but it's an ongoing offering ourselves. Let's turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. And it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And the Amplified says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in the view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive de dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Spiritual worship. We offer ourselves to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the best offering. I know we give him other things, but the best offering is our heart. We give him our heart. And, you know, may we never forget from where the Lord brought us from. However, and more importantly, you know, each day as we come to the Lord and pray and gather the manna, the word of God, may we embrace our future, which is in the Lord. What God's going to do on the earth, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. And we'll be able to celebrate throughout all eternity about that. And so in summary, now is the time to come to the Lord and to offer ourselves afresh to the Lord and allow him to deal with what's in our hearts so that we may enter into his rest. And everyone said, Amen.